All right. Uh, I'm Krzysztof Kotowicz. I'm a security researcher, uh, mostly focused on HTML5 and uh, UI redressing techniques. And today I'm going to talk about uh, using HTML5 uh, to actually attack websites or attack users of those websites. Um, HTML5, as you probably know, introduces many new elements that allow developers to construct uh, much more responsive, much more future-rich applications. But at the same time, uh, attackers have the same possibilities. They can also use the new APIs like, I don't know, drag and drop API, file API, uh, web sockets, uh, offline web applications, and all those new HTML5 um, elements uh, to actually make an, an evil website, an evil web application to, uh, uh, to harm the users. And uh, I'm going to describe some uh, example techniques that the attacker ca can use to actually uh, perform some malicious activities. Let's, have, let's meet Bob. This is uh, our victim. What do we know about, about Bob? Well, he's a CSO of any company that we are interested in hacking. Uh, of course, as a CSO, he has access to some interesting stuff. He can have... Um, important files, personal files on his uh, computer. He can um, have some cookies that we are interested in. He has access to uh, intranet uh, for his website. Uh, and I don't like him. I don't, I don't like Bob at all as an attacker. Uh, so I want to pawn him in multiple ways. And the focus of, of this talk is going to be uh, some example attacks on Bob on, on the websites that he uses. Uh, that's uh, will uh, allow me as an attacker to succeed in, in getting access to the information that the, uh, Bob um, has access to. Uh, so the first uh, scenario, attack scenario using HTML5 and related technologies. Uh, let's imagine that Bob has a hobby. He's a web security enthusiast. He likes hacking. He's not very professional in it. He's just um, trying to learn something about SQL injection or XSS and so on. Uh, and as a CSO, he has access to uh, interesting files. And I want to get th those files from his hard disk, from his uh, computer. But of course, uh, Bob is not that stupid to simply uh, lure him into a website and uh, ask him to download an exe file for him to run to, to pawn his computer. Uh, I'm going to use some uh, HTML5 technique uh, to actually try to convince Bob to handle me uh, these files um, unknowingly. Let's use something called file jacking. Uh, file jacking is based on a really obscure HTML5 feature called directory upload. This feature is uh, it's very obscure. It's actually only used in Google Docs applica application, though it has been enabled in the WebKit browsers uh, for a few years. There's only a single website on the internet that uses that, that feature. Uh, of course, there are some, um, a few other websites that simply demo the feature, but none other serious web application uses it. And this is what it says on a tin. It's a directory upload. So as soon as you... Uh, uh, have uh, input type equals file element on your web page, and you just give it a directory attribute. Uh, clicking on that input will not uh, present you with an interface to upload a file. It will present a standard browse for folder, um, Windows dialog or OSX dialog or whatever operating system you are using. And as soon as you choose a folder, uh, the JavaScript on a page uh, gets uh, read access to all the, all the files within the directory and all those subdirectories. Uh, so um, you're basically allowing the JavaScript on a page uh, to upload the whole directory to a web server or s read the file list or scan, uh, scan the files and extract some snippets from it. Uh, you get access to file names, file sizes. Uh, you can read each and, each and individual file from a directory. Uh, so the business plan for pawning Bob would be, uh, let's set up a tempting web page that the Bob would be interested in visiting. Uh, let's mm, 
insert the input type equals file, the file directory element, but overlay uh, the, that element, the button from that element, with a simple choose download location button. Uh, let's just wait for Bob and lure him into clicking that button. And when, he's, uh, when he thinks that he's actually choosing a download folder, folder for any file that me, the website, wants to uh, download to his, to his uh, hard disk, he's going to choose his, for example, I don't know, uh, desktop or downloads folder, folder. But instead of me downloading that file uh, for Bob, he's uploading the whole directory uh, to me, to the attacker. And I, I get access to all the files from the folder, folder he chose. Uh, here's how this website could have looked like. Uh, there's a, a simple form for the uh, Bob to uh, fill in, uh, just to make him unaware, uh, just to um, make him do some some thinking and clicks and uh, and uh, make him not really aware of what what is happening to to drive drive his his mindset of uh, of the actual. A button that is over here, uh, and as soon as he's uh, and as he fill out this form, uh, I'm saying that um, I will download you a personalized hacking uh, uh, tricks document. Just choose the download location. He presses it. His operating system displays a um, uh, choose down choose folder um, dialog. He chooses the folder, and I get access to all those files. This is, uh, this is a screenshot of a uh, command and control center for, for the applications. I, as you can see, there's some PDFs, uh, XLS files, and so on and so on. Uh, one would imagine that nobody would fail for the, for the trick. So I've actually tried it in real life. I've set up a um, web page with, with the exact um, content that you've seen before. Uh, and I alert my uh, blog viewers mm, for trying out this new web page and to try to download some hacking techniques for them. Uh, of course, it had very limited exposure uh, because uh, my, mm, my viewers are very precise. It's not a big group, but they are uh, almost, um, almost all of them are web security enthusiasts. So they know... Uh, they know about web security. And uh, this experiment has been running for like 13 months. It's still running now. And uh, in that period of time, I got um, the actual connections from over 200 IPs. And those um, connections actually pressed the uh, choose download folder, and I got access to their files. And I've got tons of interest in files uh, that the, even the web security crowd uploaded unknowingly to me. Uh, I got a lot of do those. Very, uh, of course, I've only downloaded some, some images and file names of other documents, uh, so as not to uh, disclose many private stuff uh, from my viewers' hard disks. Uh, but, as I said, uh, these guys were WebSec-based. So I also got access to some PHP shells, some uh, exploit codes, and so on. But uh, I thought that no one would unknowingly um, let me access their private data, some financial documents, for example. I was wrong. I got access to some password lists, uh, some letter of authorization, uh, some staff documents, uh, some resume, pricing recommendations. There were also some financial documents. Um, that I got access to, uh, but okay, I know about uh, their own documents, pri their private documents, but surely, as they are, for example, contractors for, for some uh, companies and doing pen, pen tests on them, I, they wouldn't knowingly uh, give me access to the, the client's data. Well, I was wrong again. Uh, I got access to, I don't know, some SQL injection results, some crawling tests, some uh, important questions for web developers, whatever that means. Some logs from SSL strip, some paros. Uh, this is an invoice. Uh, as you can see, oh, there's a security unarmed guard XLS. I don't know what's in that file, but uh, the name seems very interesting. So uh, this trick, though it's very stupid in, 
um, in creating it, it's also um, very effective in actually getting the access to the files of users. Uh, it is trivial to set up. Uh, you can uh, filter the files that the, um, use, uh, from the directory that the user chose by extension size, uh, just run any um, JavaScript-based uh, logic uh, to try to filter out the files that you're actually interested in and download them um, automatically. Unfortunately, it is Chrome only. Chrome is the, uh, or the WebKit browsers only. Um, only them allow the directory attribute of um, input type equals file element. And of course, it requires uh, some user interaction, so the user must be prone to social engineering. And this was uh, like an introductory uh, way of pounding Bob. Let's see some other attack. Uh, let's imagine that Bob travels a lot and uses Facebook. As he travels a lot, he uses multiple uh, Wi-Fi access points in various airports, cafes, and so on and so on. But I want to control Bob's Facebook account. And I want to control it even when he changes the password. I, I don't um, want to, for example, control um, Bob's Facebook account only by um, him leaking me the current password for, uh, for, for this one. I need it to be permanent. Also, I would really like to fingerprint Bob's intranet to see what uh, applications is he using in the intra intra intranet. Maybe there are some old versions to try to fingerprint them and so on. Well, the solution is uh, very simple. You just use some rogue access point. So construct a uh, malicious Wi-Fi access point uh, when you can modify the traffic. So you're actively performing man-in-the-middle attack uh, on Bob. Uh, but also uh, use app cache poisoning. What is app cache poisoning? Well, app cache poisoning comes from a specification uh, of HTML5 called offline web applications. And uh, it's a way of uh, applications to define, to instruct the browsers what resources, what URLs should the uh, browser download and store on disk permanently and not request those resources from the server. It is separate from the usual HTTP cache uh, that is also used by browsers um, because uh, there's no HTTP headers involved um, in um, in the specification. Uh, how would you specify which resources are uh, available um, uh, to, to download and which uh, resources should actually be downloaded by the supporting browser? Well, you put the manifest attribute uh, in the HTML element of a page and you specify a URL here. Of course, this has to be uh, within the same domain. Um, and this cache manifest is a simple text file uh, listing the uh, documents or resources uh, that should be downloaded and stored permanently uh, in a separate cache than, than the usual HTTP cache um, within the browser's profile. Uh, and the tricky thing is that uh, unlike the usual HTTP cache, which has his, uh, its own um, uh, expiration rules, uh, like for example, you can uh, specify a maximum age of documents, uh, uh, the HTTP offline web, uh, offline web applications cache expires only when the manifest is changed. So uh, when a browser, uh, when the user visits the same uh, resource, let's say this is a root of, of, of a website. If um, the user enters the same URL in his browser's address bar, presses enter, uh, the browser sees that uh, there is a manifest related with that website from, from the uh, offline web cache. It tries to refetch the cache manifest from the server. And if it doesn't change, uh, well, he, uh, it simply uses the offline uh, version, the version stored in the, in the um, cache. But if the cache manifest, stored, uh, uh, cache manifest online is changed, uh, all the URLs uh, will get retrieved and the cache will, would get pruned. Uh, so, we can abuse that fact to uh, make a phased attack. First, uh, we make Bob connect to our rogue access Wi-Fi point. 
uh, we can actively moni monitor and, uh, and uh, tamper with the traffic um, that he's um, sending to, I don't know, Facebook, say. Uh, then we inject a poison. I'm going to show what the poison looks like. Uh, after that, he disconnects from, uh, from our Wi-Fi access point, so we no longer have access to his traffic. We can't monitor it. Uh, he goes to his company and, for example, uh, visits Facebook again. Why not? And as soon as he visits Facebook, our poison is still running, and uh, I am able to perform actions just like, uh, just like before. Phase three is obviously profit. So let me show you a demo of that in action. Okay, so this is Bob. He's visiting facebook.com. And now um, I'm trying to uh, do the man-in-the-middle attack on, uh, on Bob's computer. I will simulate it with using SSL strip uh, and a proxy. So I'm uh, not performing a real man-in-the-middle attack, uh, how it would look like um, in the real life. I'm just uh, using that on localhost on my computer. Uh, so I'm running SSL strip. I'm changing my proxy settings to use the SSL strip uh, running on a port. And now I'm, okay, I can actively modi uh, modify the traffic. So. Uh, as soon as he visits Facebook, uh, I have uh, added some uh, visual effect that the traffic is actually monitored. But what is interesting is that here, there's the manifest attribute uh, appended to the HTML element. And it, it points to the robots, uh, robots text file. Uh, we, we will see why in a moment. OK. And uh, of course, I appended some malicious script. Uh, as an example, I can simply uh, hijack the login form and alert, alert his um, credentials. OK, I can also visit Hack in Paris website. Uh, and in a moment, you'll see what happens. Yeah, uh, there's also a simple um, proof that I can monitor the, monitor the traffic. Uh, and I uh, did a console log. Um, uh, evaluation and um, alerted this message to um, to the log. Yeah. Now I'm ending the man in the middle attack. I'm no no longer able to uh, monitor and um, tamper with the traffic. So I'm changing the proxy lo location uh, proxy uh, settings. And let's go to Facebook again. See. There's still, it is still, still the poison Facebook with the manifest still in place. Uh, and of course, uh, the script is still running. And uh, Hacking Paris also has this poison active. And as a bonus, a separate website, Brucon, also has the uh, poison running here. So uh, actually, we can see here that the application cache for the Facebook domain uh, is still running. Uh, and this is the cache manifest. Uh, this is the actual cache manifest. Uh, let me just maybe move there. Yeah. This is the actual cache manifest uh, that was, uh, that's the poison for, for Bob. And uh, what I actually uh, also did, I just modified the Google Analytics script, which is used all over the web. Uh, and this is an, uh, this is an old trick. Uh, that's just a bonus to the attack uh, with AppCache Poison. So this was what was alerting uh, in the console. Of course, uh, the only mitigation for Bob is to uh, clear uh, his um, cache. Uh, but the important thing is uh, this one. Uh, in English, it will be remove your cookies and other data from websites, I guess. Uh, so only when this um, checkbox is checked uh, would the app cache get, um, get actually um, removed. Yeah, this will. So what actually did we abuse? Well, we abused two things. The first thing is the specification says that the manifest file has to be of a certain MIME type. And uh, if it isn't, it won't get processed. 
And the second, uh, the second quirk that I used is that the WebKit browser, the Chrome browser, if, uh, without, it doesn't uh, need the user um, uh, intervention or interaction or confirmation to, uh, to actually fill a cache. If a website asks to be uh, cached by the offline, offline web application cache, Chrome will silently just, uh, just allow it. Firefox, for example, uh, will display a, a confirmation bo box. Uh, so what I did uh, while uh, man in the middle in Bob, I have appended the manifest pointing to a robots.txt file and appended the evil script. Uh, also, I have tampered the robots.txt that was uh, uh, requested by the browser because of this entry. And so I, I, this, is a, this is a poison. This simply says, uh, cache the main page, cache this HTML uh, document with the modif modified uh, payload, and uh, fetch from the ne network everything else. So, so the Facebook would work, work like, like usual. All those other style sheets, images, and so on would get fetched uh, online and updated uh, every time. But later on, when I'm no, no longer modifying the traffic, uh, Bob visits the victim website. In this case, this was a Facebook. Uh, it is being fetched from AppCache. Uh, the manifest file is being checked. Uh, so it sends the get request for the robots.txt file. But, of course, robots.txt on a real Facebook server is just a text plain document. So the browser says, okay, there is no new manifest. This was just a wrong MIME type. Sorry, I I'm going to use the old cache. So the tainted uh, application cache is still being used. Uh, with this technique, uh, we can basically poison any URL, uh, of course, uh, under the condition that it's not uh, SSL encrypted. Uh, the payload stays until it is manually removed by the user. And by the way, if you are clearing the cache while uh, browsing uh, through a malicious uh, access point, uh, it's not enough. Because I can actively monitor the traffic and inject it, for example, every second. Uh, uh, with every second, I can, I can repopulate the cache that you are just clearing. So uh, if you want to clear the cache and stay safe, uh, do it uh, after disconnecting from the um, uh, um, suspect uh, uh, from the uh, Wi-Fi access point that you suspect uh, is doing some harm to you. Of course, it needs the, an active man in the middle to inject. You can try this technique with uh, the fork that I made from SSL strip uh, with uh, added to the tampering with the um, application cache. Uh, okay, the third attack. Uh, let's imagine that Bob really loves sharing photos. On pretty much any photo sharing site, Instagram or uh, Flickr uh, or Facebook even. And let's imagine uh, that I want to replace Bob as CSO. So I'm really interested in discrediting Bob. And one easy way to discredit someone is to upload uh, either a um, concerning image on his behalf uh, on the public website and then, I don't know, uh, draw the journalist's attention. Uh, so th this is, this is one uh, simple way of discrediting uh, people. Uh, and the question is, can HTML5 actually help in that? Uh, of course, it can, it can uh, with a silent file upload. Uh, silent file upload is the way of silently uploading file. So uh, what I'm actually doing is I'm simulating uh, what request would the browser um, sent to the target application uh, if uh, Bob would uh, simply choose any file from, uh, from, this, uh, from this element, cho choose a file from his hard disk and press the submit of the form. Uh, and with this technique, I, I can make Bob send pretty much uh, any file name and any file content. What is important, I'm not sending I'm not trying to send um, a file from Bob's hard disk. I don't have access to those unless I'm file jacking. Uh, I'm trying to manually, silently co construct, uh, construct a file upload request with the file contents of my uh, control. So, for example, I can, uh, I can, I can uh, inject with JavaScript this little image uh, without even uh, touching uh, Bob's hard drive. 
the silent file upload uh, uses yet another HTML5 uh, feature called cross-origin resource sharing. And cross-origin resource sharing, to put it shortly, is just a cross-domain AJAX, so uh, a technique that is used uh, for years to create uh, responsive um, uh, web applications. And uh, what is the uh, setup? Well, the setup is that I need to lure Bob into visiting my, uh, my page. And within that page, there is simply a, a JavaScript code uh, constructing an HTML, uh, XML HTTP request object and uh, sending a post request to the victim. Uh, web this is a photo sharing site, for example. Uh, setting the content type, it doesn't have to be a text plane. Uh, we'll modify it in a moment. And uh, using the with credential flag. With credential flag is the new uh, feature uh, of HTML5 cross-origin resource sharing, it simply says attach cookies to the request. Attach cookies uh, that the browser has for the victim mm, website. And what is important, uh, within the post body, I can send anything I want. This is not, uh, not um, this doesn't have the uh, limit, limits of the um, usual uh, form submit method of submitting a form uh, quietly. What I'm actually doing is I'm using the cross-origin resource sharing to construct a multi-part form data request. This is the most popular uh, MIME type for handling file uploads in the internet. Uh, so I'm setting the content type uh, of multi-part form data with a certain boundary, and I'm constructing manually the whole MIME uh, request, or MIME type of request. Uh, in here, there's the binary file data that I simply passed as a parameter to, the, to this function. Uh, and uh, of course there's a, there's a boundary, uh, this is the file name, and I'm sending this whole text, this whole body to, to the target web server. Mm. Of course uh, this requires a cross-site request forgery uh, vulnerability in a website. So uh, if a website accepts uh, files or accepts forms in general without um, a certain token, unique token, that, uh, that is not known to the attacker, um, well, we can use that trick. Uh, what is also important, we don't get access to the actual response from the server, so we're simply sending a blind request with the file uploaded, and let's hope for the best that the file uh, actually got uh, submitted. So let me show you an, an actual demo of... Uh, what happened, this, this is a demo from, I think, around a year and a half, when I found the CSRF flow in Flickr file upload. And this is just a demonstration of, of, of how it looks, um, how the attack um, looks like. First, I'm logging in to, uh, to Flickr, to a photo sharing uh, website by Yahoo. Uh, Flickr is very... Um, Fine application, but uh, as you can see, I have no cookies here. This is empty account. Uh, Flickr is very nice because it, it uses the remember me cookie. So a permanent cookie uh, that uh, stays throughout uh, browser sessions. So I can uh, abuse the uh, Flickr application having the CSRF flow uh, without uh, needing the um, user to be actually using uh, Flickr on a separate tab, for example, without having him actively logged into Flickr within his browser session, because the Remember Me cookie handles the uh, authentication of, of Flickr user for me. Uh, and Bob, let's say he visits my um, attacker um, website. He presses some uh, button, of course this is optional to press a button, and as you can probably see here, da, 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 sorry, I skipped. Yeah, he visits mm, my website, presses a, oh, see? Here I'm posting to the Flickr application, photos upload transfer, this was a, uh, this was a form, uh, form that was not used in, in whole Flickr because Flickr went up to, um, and I uploaded a file uh, on behalf of, uh, of a user. Uh, Flickr used Flash to handle uploads, but it also had a fallback mechanism with uh, usual standard HTML uh, file upload form. And of course, 
this particular form uh, had a CSRF token. And uh, in general, Flickr uses CSRF tokens for uh, authenticating form uh, uh, submissions. But it simply didn't check the token on that particular form. So they knew some, something was, was happening. Uh, they, they knew that the CSRF is uh, really uh, dangerous, but that they had no uh, clue on how to protect the file upload forms because uh, there was... Uh, there are very uh, unique ways of how one can uh, forge a file upload form within the browser. There was some, uh, some ways you could do it in Flash a few years ago. There was uh, some browser bugs that allowed you to, uh, to make an arbitrary post request with anybody. Uh, uh, but it was like a few months period uh, in 2006 or seven, I guess, when you could do that and the bug was uh, quickly fixed. Uh, so now you have a standard feature, uh, which is a part of HTML5, that allows you to upload any file uh, on, on a victim website as, as long as this victim website doesn't uh, use uh, CSRF tokens. The same flow was recently found uh, in the GlassVision Enterprise server. Uh, it was found by Roberto Suji Liverani, uh, and as it turns out, a Glassfish Enterprise Server administrative interface uh, doesn't have CSRF token for the admin user. And uh, the admin user is very uh, powerful because he can upload the uh, WAR applications. So uh, basically, with having a logged in ad admin user on a separate tab and exploiting the fact that there is no uh, CSRF anti-CSRF anti tokens, uh, required by the file upload form or the application upload form in this case, you get the remote code execution uh, because you can upload pretty much any Java application here and it would run in the context of the server. Uh, this was a pretty, pretty big bug. Of course, it's fixed now uh, by the Oracle. Uh, let's now get back to basics. Uh, who of you know what, what is the same origin policy? One person, okay. So, so let, let's get to, to basics really quick. Well, cross-origin policy is what makes uh, the current web relatively safe. Uh, basically, it's a restriction of communications between websites of different origins or different domains, um, DNS domains, let's say. Uh, basically, the most uh, common form of uh, same origin policy says that the website A cannot read uh, the resources of website B, like cannot read, it, uh, cannot read its uh, HTML uh, content, uh, cannot read the script, and so on and so on. Of course, the same origin policy can be relaxed, and there are several mechanisms for that. Uh, Cross-origin resource sharing is a mechanism that allows you to relax the same origin policy. Uh, but at the same time, same origin policy can be ignored. You can simply uh, use your users to bypass the same origin policy for you. So by uh, requiring user interaction, you can uh, abuse the users to perform actions that are uh, forbidden because of same origin policy. Uh, but UI redressing is a really uh, hard term and I don't like it at all. What I like to call those techniques is, is Jedi mind tricks because that's what you are actually doing. You are playing Jedi mind tricks on, on the victim users. Uh, you are trying to... Uh, convince them that they are not looking at the page that they are actually looking at, uh, that they are not clicking the thing that they are clicking. They are not dragging, typing, copying, and all those actions that the users usually perform uh, when interacting with applications uh, can be simulated, emulated, or obfuscated. Uh, and as a result, victims attack the applications for us. Uh, the most common form of UI redressing attacks is a clickjacking. Uh, but unfortunately, we don't have time to describe what clickjacking is. Uh, so let's see uh, another uh, technique of uh, UI redressing. Let's imagine that Bob likes online games. Uh, and I found uh, through the reconnaissance of his intranet that uh, he is using a vulnerable website somewhere um, in, in his internet, intranet. Uh, but uh, the website is vulnerable to XSS in a, in a very specific way uh, that uh, makes the... Uh, that uh, to be able to launch, for example, the XSS, the Bob has to type the payload itself in the input field of the application. So 
very tricky to, to make someone type in the XSS payload uh, uh, unknowingly. So let's make Bob play a game. Yeah, this is the example of such an application. Of course, it, uh, it has, a, as you can see, uh, XSS flow here in this field. But the point is, uh, there's no URL that I could hand uh, um, the user to just simply press enter on this field or click a link with a URL that would uh, trigger the exploit. Uh, so I need to come up on something different. Can come up with something different. See, uh, yeah, I've set up a uh, I've set up a game on a separate uh, on a separate uh, origin, separate domain. This is attacker. Yeah, and the game looks like this. He drags some letters. And now he, he is asked to check the score of, uh, of the game. And as soon as he presses the check score, uh, I'm simply executing the uh, payload in the context of the victim application. What actually happened is uh, that the first few letters are just, uh, just uh, to confuse the user, to, to make him do drag and drop very quickly. And the last one, the letter G, uh, is when the iframe appears here. Of course, it, it is invisible, usually. And it travels with a mouse. This is also a very popular form of, uh, <coughs> or technique of uh, you are addressing attacks. And as soon as he drops, uh, drops the letter G here, he's, uh, he's actually dropping the payload that is embedded within the letter G uh, using the uh, drag and drop API uh, on the input field on the victim application. And of course, I only need, um, need to make him click the search button here to trigger the exploit, uh, which is uh, obfuscated with this check score. So this is a technique called uh, drag uh, into. You can trigger self-access. You can uh, pretty much fill out any, any form uh, of a victim application with uh, your uh, hidden content, attacker's content. Uh, unfortunately, it's Firefox only, and it will, it will die, the bug will die soon. I would say about three months, uh, because somebody, someone is already fixing the bug in a Firefox code. Uh, of course, there's the next frame options, which is the best uh, currently known defense uh, from uh, you are addressing attacks. Uh, and as soon as website uses that header, uh, this wouldn't get executed. Uh, and the last one uh, I would like to, to show, uh, I would like to show you is, uh, mm, uh, let's imagine that Bob has access to an inter internal HR, HR applications with all the salaries of, of his subordinates uh, and his own and so on. But I really want to know his salary because I, I want to replace Bob. Uh, and I need to know what kind of uh, benefits would I, would I get from the company. So let's make Bob play a game again. Uh, the technique is uh, I'm using the two images. Uh, one is overlaid with an iframe of a victim application, and the other is overlaid with a text area. These both are invisible. And I'm trying, this is uh, the HTML code, I'm trying to make him drag something out of the victim application to the text area. And as soon as he drops something, uh, I get access to the uh, actual um, content that he was dragging here from the uh, victim application. Let's see, a, let's see a demo, and it will be the last demo. Uh, yeah. So this is a game of dragging and dropping, dr uh, dragging the balls to the, to the basket. You might s see something fishy in a, in a moment, uh, but... Yeah. You see, I get access to the actual um, HTML source of the victim application. Uh, what actually happened? What actually happened is uh, that. Yeah, let me, let me just show you show the source, right? So the first balls are the usual trick. Nothing nothing really fishy. Just just ma make him uh, drag and drop. Here's. Yeah, and here's there's an iframe, invisible, and he's dragging the ball to the basket. So the first step is he's just selecting the HTML source, uh, cleverly positioned on, on the uh, line that I want to um, get access to. And now he's dragging that on my text area, and I get access to the, uh, to the HTML. Of course, uh, this technique 
uh, is also Firefox only because it uh, relies on cross-origin uh, drag and dropping uh, uh, and no other browser allows uh, me to uh, to do the drag and drop actions cross origin. Uh, so, a brief summary: uh, HTML5 is a really nifty tool, uh, not only for the web developers but for the attackers um, also. And <coughs> attackers can create applications which are malicious too, and they can, they can abuse the legitimate uh, APIs that the HTML5 allows. Also, it is a very bad idea uh, for a web application to allow to be framed. So I would really recommend to use the X-Frame Options Deny in the web application that you, you probably uh, uh, develop. And also you can abuse uh, the users and make them uh, extract the content, for example, for your inject uh, payloads for you. Thank you. Uh, this is some website that you uh, probably want to visit if you're interested in, in the subject, uh, my Twitter and so on. Uh, s do you have any questions about the subject? Yeah? Uh, how about your uh, second cache that you have? Mm -hmm. Second version. Uh, you said that you could only include Chrome, and uh, you have to, like, to, to, to be dependent from this kind of thing, you have to delete your cookies and so on. What happens when 